Q. What do you understand by practice of law? Generally, to engage in the practice of law is to do any of those acts, which are characteristics of the legal profession. It embraces any activity in or out of court, which requires the application of law, legal principle, practice, or procedure, and calls for legal knowledge, training, and experience. It involves the carrying on of the calling of an attorney, usually for gain, acting in a representative capacity, and rendering service to another. Engaging in the practice of law presupposes the existence of an attorney-client relationship. Hence, where a lawyer undertakes an activity which requires knowledge of law but involves no attorney-client relationship such as teaching law or writing law books or article, he cannot be said to be engaged in the practice of his profession as a lawyer. Q. Is the practice of law a right or a privilege? Does the legislature have the power to regulate admission to the bar and the practice of law? The practice of law is basically a privilege because it is limited to persons of good moral character with special qualifications duly ascertained and certified. Thus, only those persons are allowed to practice law who by reason of attainments previously acquired through education and study have been recognized by the courts as possessing profound knowledge of legal science. Attorneys are the court's constituency to aid in the administration of justice. B. Congress under the 1987 Constitution has no power to regulate admission to the bar and the practice of law. Unlike the 1935 and 1973 constitutions, the 1987 constitution no longer provides for the power of the legislature to repeal, alter, and supplement the rules promulgated by the Supreme Court. Under the 1935 constitution, the legislature had the power to repeal or alter the rules promulgated by the Supreme Court, although the power and the responsibility to admit members of the bar resides in the Supreme Court. Under the 1987 Constitution, however, the Supreme Court has the exclusive power to promulgate rules concerning the enforcement of rights, pleadings and practice and procedures of all courts, and the admission to the practice of law. Q. Being a lawyer and or a member of the bar is an exceptional privilege worth aspiring for, although it entails a lot of responsibilities and obligations, A, to the court, B, to fellow lawyers, C, to the clients, and lastly, to the public in general. Briefly discuss these obligations and responsibilities. Answer. First and foremost, among the duties of the lawyer is his duty to the court. The chief mission of an attorney is to assist in the administration of justice. To this end, his client's success in the case is subordinate. His primary responsibility is to uphold the cause of justice. Thus, the lawyer takes orders from the court and not from his client. The lawyer must always maintain respect to the court. He must use respectful language. He must defend the dignity and respect to the court. He must also cooperate with the court by being ready with his case and by being punctual and candid with the court. B. The lawyer must maintain harmonious relations with the members of the bar. He must be candid and courteous with fellow lawyers. He should deal fairly and squarely with others and not take undue advantage over them. No ill feeling must be entertained by him against the lawyer of the adverse party. According to the Supreme Court in People v. Says Brino, clients, not the lawyers, are the litigants so that all personalities between counsel and client should be avoided. He should also be a respectable member of the IBP and other bar associations. He must not encroach upon professional employment. He should not solicit cases and advertise his profession. C. 
The lawyer owes entire devotion to his client to protect his interest within the bounds of law and legal ethics. He must be candid with his client and advise him properly if he has no valid cause of action. The lawyer must also maintain absolute trust and not to demand unconscionable attorney's fees. He should not reveal information obtained from him given in secrecy. Likewise, he should not purchase the property which is the subject matter of litigation. He should not appear for conflicting interest. D. The attorney's duties to the public is that he should set an example as a law-abiding citizen and give due respect to the lawful authorities. He should not instigate unnecessary lawsuits. One important duty of the lawyer, especially at this time, is to defend cases of indigent litigants for free. He must take active part in free legal aid services. Q. Justice C. recently retired. The parents of the victim of the ozone disco tragedy retained him in the case for damages which they filed against the owners of the disco. Quezon City officials in Quezon City. Can he appear as counsel for the victim's parents? Explain. Answer. Section 1 of Republic Act No. 910 as amended provides that it is a condition of the pension provided for herein that no retiring justice or judge of a court of record or city or municipal judge during the time that he is receiving the said pension shall appear before any court in any civil case wherein the government or any subdivision or instrumentality thereof is the adverse party or in any criminal case wherein an officer or employee of the government is accused of an offense committed in relation to his office or collect any fee for his appearance in any administrative proceedings to maintain an interest adverse to the government, national, provincial, or municipal, or to any of its legally instituted officers. Inasmuch as the case being offered to Justice C is a civil case against not only the disco itself, but also against Quezon City and its officials, he will be violating the aforesaid condition if he appears as counsel for the victim's parents in the said case. Q5. Generally, only those who are members of the bar can appear in court. Are there exceptions to this rule? Explain. The exceptions to the rule that only those who are members of the bar can appear in court are the following. A. In the municipal trial court, a party may conduct his litigation in person or with the aid of an agent or a friend. Section 34, Rule 138. B. In any other court, a party may conduct his litigation personally, except in criminal cases for grave felonies where a party must be represented by counsel. C. In criminal proceedings before a municipal trial court in a locality where a duly licensed member of the bar is not available, the court may in its discretion admit or assign a person resident of the province of good repute for probity and ability to aid the defendant in his defense, although the person assigned is not a duly authorized member of the bar. Section 4, Rule 116. D. Any official or other person appointed or designated in accordance with the law to appear for the government of the Philippines shall have all the rights of a duly authorized member of the bar to appear in any case which said government has an interest direct or indirect. E. A senior law student who is enrolled in a recognized law school's clinical education program approved by the Supreme Court may appear before any court without compensation to represent indigent clients accepted by the legal clinic of the law school. F. Non-lawyers may appear before the NLRC or any labor arbiter if they represent themselves or their labor organization or members thereof. T. Under the Cadastral Act, a non-lawyer can represent a claimant before the Cadastral Court. Section 9 Act 2259. Q. 6. 
Attorney A services as a lawyer were engaged by B to recover from C a certain construction material and equipment. Because B did not have the means to defray the expenses of litigation, he proposed to Attorney A that he, A, shoulders all expenses of the litigation and he, B, would pay him A, a portion of the construction materials and equipment to be recovered as compensation for his professional services. May Attorney A correctly agree to such an arrangement? No. Attorney A may not correctly agree to such an agreement. Such an agreement would constitute a chumpertus contract, which is considered void due to public policy, because it would make him acquire a stake in the outcome of the litigation, which might lead him to place his own interest above that of the client. Bautista versus Gonzalez. A chumpertus contract is one in which a lawyer undertakes to prosecute a case and bear all the expenses in connection therewith without right of reimbursement and will be paid his fees by way of a portion of the property or amount that may be recovered, contingent on the success of his efforts. It is different from a contingent fee contract, which is valid, in which the lawyer will also be paid depending on the success of his efforts, but he does not undertake to shoulder all the expenses in the case. He may advance such expenses but always subject to reimbursement by his client. Q7. Is a contingency fee contract not violative of Article 1491 of the Civil Code? No, because the litigation is already terminated. Q8. What is your understanding of form shopping? What are the possible consequences? Form shopping as the improper practice of filing several actions or petitions in the same or different tribunals arising from the same cause and seeking substantially identical reliefs in the hope of winning in one of them. Possible consequences of form shopping are 1. Summary dismissal of the multiple petition or complaint 2. Penalty for direct contempt of court on the party and his lawyer 3. Criminal action for a false certification of non-form shopping. Fourth, disciplinary proceedings for the lawyer concerned. Section 5, Rule 7, 1997, Rules of Civil Procedure. Q. Prosecutor Daniel Marquinez was assigned to handle a case for a homicide. After interviewing the witnesses for the prosecution and asking them to narrate to him the incident that caused the death of the victim, he came to the conclusion that the accused was really guilty. However, the version of one eyewitness showed that the accused acted in self-defense. If you were the prosecutor, would you place said eyewitness on the witness stand? Why? Under the ordinary rules on trial technique, the prosecutor should not place the eyewitness on the witness stand. However, Based on the real mission of a lawyer, which is to assist the court in the administration of justice, the prosecutor is bound to present the eyewitness in order that the court can properly appreciate the evidence and to decide on the real merit of the case. A public prosecutor is a quasi-judicial officer. He is the representative not of an ordinary party to a controversy, but of a sovereignty whose obligation to govern impartially is as compelling as its obligation to govern at all, and whose interest, therefore, in a criminal prosecution is not that it shall win the case, but justice shall be done. A prosecutor complies with his mission as a lawyer even if the man he is prosecuting is acquitted in accordance with law and justice. Canon 6 Rule 601 of the Code of Professional Responsibility provides that the primary duty of a lawyer engaged in public prosecution is not to convict but to see that justice is done. The suppression of facts or the concealment of witnesses capable of establishing the innocence of the accused is highly reprehensible and is cause for disciplinary action. Q10 what are the powers and duties of a notary public? 
a notary public is empowered to do the following acts. Acknowledgements. 2. Oaths and affirmations. 3. Jurats. 4. Signature witnessing. 5. Copy certifications. and 6. Any other act authorized by these rules. What is the extent of the jurisdiction of a notary public? A notary public is authorized to certify the affixing of a signature by thumb or other mark on an instrument or document presented for an authorization. If the thumb or other mark is affixed in the presence of the notary public and of two disinterested and unaffected witnesses to the instrument or document, two, both witnesses sign their own names in addition to the thumb or other mark, three, the notary public writes below the thumb or other mark Tom or other mark affixed by name of signatory by mark in the presence of names and addresses of witnesses and undersigned notary public and the notary public notarizes the signature by thumb or other mark through an acknowledgement jurat or signature witnessing to keep a notarial register to make the proper entry or entries in his notarial register touching his notarial acts in the manner required by law. To send the copy of the entries to the proper clerk of court within the first 10 days of the month next following. To affix to acknowledgments the date of expiration of his commission as required by law. To forward his notarial register when filled to the proper clerk of court to make report within a reasonable time to the proper judge concerning the performance of his duties as may be required by such judge, to make the proper notation regarding residence certificates. The jurisdiction of a notary public in a province shall be coextensive with the province. The jurisdiction of a notary public in the city of Manila shall be coextensive with said city. No notary shall possess authority to do any notarial act beyond the limits of his jurisdiction. Who can revoke his notarial commission? The notarial commission may be revoked by the executive judge of the regional trial court who issued the commission or by the Supreme Court itself for any ground on which an application for a commission may be denied. In addition, the executive judge may revoke the commission of or impose sanctions upon any notary public who 1. fails to keep a notarial register, b. fails to make the appropriate entry or entries in his notarial register concerning his notarial acts, fails to send a copy of the entries to the executive judge within the first 10 days of the month following, fails to affix to acknowledgments the date of expiration of his commission, fails to submit his notarial register when filled to the executive judge, fails to make his report within a reasonable time to the executive judge concerning the performance of his duties, as may be required by the judge, fails to require the presence of the principal at the time of the notarial act, fails to identify a principal on the basis of personal knowledge or competent evidence, Execute a false or incomplete certificate under Section 5, Rules 4. Knowingly perform or fails to perform any other act prohibited or mandated by these rules and commits any other dereliction or act which in the judgment of the executive judge constitutes good cause for the revocation of the commission or imposition of administrative sanction. AM number 028. 13 Supreme Court Rules on Notarial Practice of 2004 Q11 The agreement between the estranged husband and wife provided for, among others, the liquidation of the conjugal partnership of gains, custody of the children, and support of the children. In the same agreement, the couple waived the right to prosecute each other for bigamy, adultery, concubinage, and whatever acts of infidelity. There was also a condemnation Provision. The agreement was prepared and notarized by a lawyer who was the best man at the wedding. What are the liabilities, if any, of the lawyer? Explain. The document executed by the spouses is immoral and contrary to law. The lawyer who drafted and notarized all said documents 
committed malpractice and can be disbarred or suspended. Although the principal duty of the notary public is to ascertain the identity of the parties and the voluntariness of the declaration, it is nevertheless incumbent upon him to guard against any illegal or immoral agreement, especially so in this case involving marriage, a social institution which should remain inviolable. Q12. You are a young, brilliant, and promising lawyer. Unfortunately, these qualities do not seem to attract as many clients as you wish. Your friend suggested that you advertise. He just arrived from the States and has seen prints and television advertisements for lawyers. What kind of advertising, if any, can you do? Explain. The ethics of the profession forbids a lawyer to solicit professional employment by circulars and advertisements. Even indirect advertisement for professional employment offend the traditions and lower the dignity of the legal profession. The lawyer may make announcement of true, honest, fair, dignified, and objective information of statement of facts. Canon 3. Attorney Dulcinea writes a regular column in a newspaper of general circulation and articles on unforgettable legal stories in a leading magazine. Her byline always includes the name of her firm, where she is a named partner. Would you consider this as improper advertising? Explain. Attorney Dulcinea's byline, including the firm name where she belongs, is improper because it is an indirect way of solicitation or is an advertisement of the law firm. Q30. You are the counsel of K and his action for specific performance against DEF Incorporated, a subdivision developer which is represented by Attorney L. Your client believes that the president of DEF Incorporation would be willing to consider an amicable settlement and your client urges you to discuss the matter with DEF without the presence of Attorney L, whom he considered to be an impediment to an early compromise. Would it be a right for you to negotiate the terms of the compromise as so suggested about by your client? Answer, no. Rule 802, Canon 8 of the Code of Professional Responsibility provides that a lawyer shall not directly or indirectly encroach upon the professional employment of another lawyer. Canon 9 of the Code of Professional Ethics is more particular. A lawyer should not in any way communicate upon the subject of the controversy with a party represented by counsel. As much less should he undertake to negotiate or compromise the matter with him, but should deal only with his counsel. In the case of Lee Kong v. Lim, 235-414, a lawyer was suspended for negotiating a compromise agreement directly with the adverse party without the presence and participation of her counsel. Q14. When is a public comment and criticism of a court decision permissible, and when would it be improper? A lawyer, like every citizen, enjoys the right to comment on and criticize the decision of a court. As an officer of the court, a lawyer is expected not only to expose the shortcomings and indiscretions of courts and judges, but such right is subject to the limitations that it shall be bona fide. It is improper to subject them to abuse and slander, degrade them or destroy public confidence in them. Moreover, a lawyer shall not attribute to a judge motives not supported by the record or have no materiality in the case. Rule 1104, Code of Professional Responsibility. Q15. When may refusal of a counsel to act as counsel of should be justified on grounds aside from the reasons of health, extensive travel abroad, or similar reasons of urgency? Support your answer. Other justified grounds for refusal to act as a counsel the official are too many the official cases assigned to the lawyer, People v. De, De Yang, 49 Squad 222. B. Conflict of interest, 
Rule 1403. C. Lawyer is not in a position to carry out the work effectively or competently. D. Lawyer is prohibited from practicing law by reason of his public office, which prohibits appearances in court. And E. Lawyer is preoccupied with too many cases which will spell prejudice to the new client. Q16. Attorney J. Bonanza, a semi-retired Metro Manila practitioner, has a cattle ranch in the remote municipality of Karanglan, Nueva Ecija. He attends to his law office in Manila on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, and the rest of the week he spends in his cattle ranch raising horses. In a criminal case pending before the Municipal Trial Court of Karanglan, the only other licensed member of the bar in the place is representing the complainant. The accused is a detention prisoner. The judge wants to expedite proceedings. A. What must the judge do to expedite proceedings? B. If Attorney Bonanza is requested to act as counsel for the accused, could he or should he refuse by saying that in the province he wants to do nothing except ride horses and castrate bulls? Explain. A. The judge may appoint Attorney Bonanza's counsel the official considering that the accused is a detention prisoner, and therefore it is assumed that he has no financial means of engaging a paid counsel. B. The attorney cannot refuse to be appointed as counsel the official merely on the reason that he is a semi-retired practicing lawyer. Precisely one of the reasons for the integration of the bar in the Philippines is to compel all persons who have been admitted to the practice of law in the Philippines to perform their duties to assist the courts in the administration of justice. Q17. Hui Company and Dewey Corporation are both retainer clients of Attorney Anima. He is the corporate secretary of Hui Company. He represents Dewey Corporation in three pending litigation cases. Dewey Corporation wants to file a case against Hui Company and has requested Attorney Anima to handle the case. 1. What are the options available to Attorney Anima? Explain your answer. Number 2. If you were Attorney Anima, which option would you take? 1. The options available to Attorney Anima are A. To decline to accept the case because to do so will constitute representing conflicting interests. It is unethical for a lawyer to represent a client in a case against another client in the said case. B. To accept to file the case against Huey Company after full disclosure to both retained clients and upon their express and written consent. The written consent may free him from the charge of representing conflicting interests because written consent amounts to a release by the clients of the lawyer's obligation not to represent conflicting interests. Number two, if I were attorney anima, I will choose the first option and inhibit myself in the case as both entities are my clients. The conflict of interest between the contending clients may reach such a point that, notwithstanding their consent to the common representation, the lawyer may be suspected of disloyalty by one client. His continuing to act in a double capacity strikes deeply in the foundation of the attorney-client relationship. Q18 Nene approached attorney Nilo and asked him if it was all right to buy a piece of land which Maneng was selling. What was shown by Maneng to Nene was an original certificate of title with many annotations and old patches, to which Nene expressed suspicion. However, attorney Nilo is serious of pushing through with the transaction because of the high notarial fee promised to him, told Nene that the title was a right and that she should not worry since he is an attorney and that he knew Maneng well. He notarized the deed of sale and Nene paid Maneng 108,000 pesos. It turned out that Maneng had previously sold the same property to another person. For the injustice done to Nene, may attorney Nilo be disciplined? Yes, 
Attorney Nello is guilty of gross negligence in protecting the interests of his client. A lawyer shall not neglect a legal matter entrusted to him and his negligence in connection therewith shall render him liable. Rule 1803, Code of Professional Responsibility. Worse, he was negligent because he placed his own interest in receiving a high notarial fee over and above the interest of his client. In the case of Nadayag versus Gregita, 237-202, which involves similar facts, the Supreme Court held that the lawyer should have been conscientious in seeing to it that justice permitted every aspect of a transaction for which his services had been engaged in conformity with the avowed duties of a worthy member of the bar. Q19. An attorney-client relationship starts from the moment the attorney is engaged or retained. A. Discuss briefly the different types of fee arrangements an attorney may enter into with his client. B. In the absence of such a fee arrangement, how would the services of an attorney be compensated? Explain. The following are the types of fee arrangements. 1. Retainer's fee, where the lawyer is paid for services for an agreed amount for the case. 2. The lawyer agrees to be paid per court appearance. 3. Contingent fee, where the lawyer is paid for his services depending on the success of the case. This applies usually in civil suits for money or property where the lawyer's fee is taken from the award granted by the court. Fourth, attorney de officio. The attorney is appointed by the court to defend the indigent litigant in a criminal case. The client is not bound to pay the attorney for his services, although he may be paid a nominal fee taken from a public fund appropriated for the purpose. Five, legal aid. The attorney renders legal services for those who could not afford to engage the services of paid counsel. 6. Quantum merit basis. If there is no specific contract between the lawyer and the client, the lawyer is paid on quantum merit basis, that is, what the lawyer deserves for his services. b. In the absence of a fee arrangement, the lawyer is paid on a quantum merit basis. The factors to be taken into consideration in determining the amount are 1. The amount and character of the services rendered 2. The labor, time, and trouble involved 3. The nature and importance of the litigation or business in which the services were rendered 4. The amount of money or the value of the property affected by the controversy involved in the employment 5. The skill and experience called for in the performance of the services. 6. The professional character and social standing of attorney. 7. The result secured. 8. Whether or not the fees are absolute or contingent. Delgado versus Dilarama. 43 Phil. 499. Or Panis versus Young Co. 52 Phil. 499. Q 20. Discuss briefly your understanding of the relationship between an attorney and his client. 2. How is such a relationship created? Explain. The relationship between an attorney and client is fiduciary, confidential, and personal by virtue thereof. The lawyer owes fidelity to the cause of his client and he shall be mindful of the trust and confidence reposed in him. 2. The attorney and client relationship is created by implied or expressed contract. The relationship is also created if he is a court appointed counsel. By the way, before I forget, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It's free and activate that bell notification. I truly appreciate your support. Disclaimer, I do not own any of these materials I turn into audios. This particular bar key questions was downloaded online. Q21. Does the client have the right to dismiss his lawyer at any time? Explain your answer. 2. Does the client have the right to hire another lawyer as collaborating counsel at any time? Explain. 3. When can a lawyer validly withdraw as counsel? Explain.
Answer to number one, yes. The client has the right to dismiss his lawyer anytime with or without cause. The reason is that a lawyer's employment is strictly personal and highly confidential in nature. The client's loss of confidence in his lawyer deprives the relation of that special element of trust. Number two, yes, the client has the right to hire another lawyer as collaborating counsel anytime. It is the prerogative of the client to employ as many attorneys as he may desire to protect his interest. Three, a lawyer can validly withdraw as counsel for good cause and upon notice. Canon 22, Rule 2201 provides that a lawyer may withdraw his services in any of the following cases. A. When the client pursues an illegal or immoral course of conduct in connection with the matter he is handling. B. When the client insists that the lawyer pursue conduct violative of these canons and rules. C. When his inability to work with co-counsel will not promote the best interest of the client. E. When the mental and physical condition of the lawyer renders it difficult for him to carry out the employment effectively. E. When the client deliberately fails to pay the fees for the services or fails to comply with the retainer agreement. F. When the lawyer is elected as appointed to public office and G. Other similar cases. Q. 22. Ben filed proceedings for disbarment against his lawyer, attorney Ku, following the latter's conviction for estafa for misappropriating funds belonging to his client, Ben. While the proceedings for disbarment was pending, the president granted absolute pardon in favor of attorney Ku. Attorney Ku then moved for the dismissal of the disbarment case. Should the motion be granted? Answer. An absolute pardon by the president is one that operates to wipe out the conviction as well as the offense itself. The grant thereof to a lawyer is a bar to a proceeding for disbarment against him if such proceeding is based solely on the fact that such conviction in Re Parcassion 69 Squa 336 but where the proceeding to this part is founded on the professional misconduct involved in the transaction, which culminated in his conviction, the effect of the pardon is only to relieve him of the penal consequences of his act, and does not operate as a bar to the disbarment proceedings. Inasmuch as the criminal acts may nevertheless constitute proof that the attorney does not possess good moral character. Lontok 43, Phil 293. Q. 23. Attorney Santiago was disbarred by a resolution of the Supreme Court. Five years later, Attorney Santiago filed a petition for reinstatement, alleging that he had reformed and that he had been sufficiently punished and disciplined. However, no action was taken on the petition. In the meantime, in a proceeding for the probate of his father's will, Attorney Santiago filed a formal opposition on his own behalf and sought to establish that the will was a forgery and that the deceased died intestate. His co-ears questioned his appearance citing his disbarment. May the appearance of Attorney Santiago be allowed? State your reason. Attorney Santiago can properly represent himself as oppositor in the probate of the will of his father. While he has been disbarred from practice and has not been reinstated to practice law, he can properly represent himself because representing himself is not practice of law. Rule 138, Section 34 of the Rules of Court allows an individual litigant to conduct his litigation personally. It means that he can do everything in the defense of his rights in the said case. The prohibition against the practice of law by a layman or a disbarred lawyer as not in conflict with the right of an individual to defend or prosecute a cause in which he is a party. An individual has long been permitted to manage, prosecute, and defend his own action, but his representation on his behalf is not considered to be the practice of law. One does not practice law by acting for himself any more than he practices medicine by rendering first aid to himself. For this reason, 
an attorney who is Q24. Judge A went to Hong Kong on vacation on board a Philippine Airlines plane, and he stayed in a first-class hotel for three days and three nights. The round-trip ticket, Manila, Hong Kong, Manila, and board and lodging in a hotel where he stayed were paid for as a birthday gift to the judge by a friend whose son has a case for a staffa pending in another branch of the court where Judge A is assigned. Did Judge A commit any infraction of the Code of Judicial Conduct under the circumstances? Yes, he violated Canon 5, Rule 504 of the Code of Judicial Conduct, which provides that a judge or any immediate member of the family shall not accept a gift, be cast, favor or loan from anyone except as may be allowed by law. Also, Canon 2 of the same code provides that a judge should avoid impropriety and the appearance of impropriety in all activities. Accepting a birthday gift of a vacation in Hong Kong from a friend whose son has a case for a staff pending in another branch of the court where Judge A is assigned raises a suspicion of impropriety on his part. The fact that the case is pending in another branch is immaterial because he could be suspected of having been bribed to influence the presiding judge of the other branch. A judge shall refrain from influencing in any manner the outcome of litigation or dispute pending before another court or administrative agency. Rule 2.04 Code of Judicial Conduct Q25 While Ms. Malumanai, a witness for the plaintiff, was under cross-examination, Judge Mausisa asked questions alternately with the counsel for the defendant. After four questions by the judge, the plaintiff's counsel moved that the judge refrain from asking further questions, which tended to favor the defense and leave the examination of the witness to the defendant's counsel, who was a new lawyer. The judge explained that he was entitled to ask certain questions. A. Is the motion tenable? Why? Letter B. Can the judge justify his intervention? How? Letter A. It depends. Rule 306 of the Code of Judicial Conduct provides that while a judge may, to promote justice, prevent waste of time, or clear up some obscurity, properly intervene in the presentation of evidence during the trial, it should always be borne in mind that undue interference may prevent the proper presentation of the cause or the ascertainment of truth. Thus, if in asking for questions alternately with the counsel for the defendant, Judge Mausisa was only trying to clear up some obscurity. He cannot be accused of undue interference. But if his searching questions were such as to give the impression that he was already acting as a counsel for the defendant, his conduct is improper. Letter B. The judge can justify his intervention on any of the grounds mentioned by the rule namely, to promote justice, avoid waste of time, or clear up some obscurity. Q26. 1. Discuss briefly the grounds for disqualification or inhibition of judges to try a case. Under Rule 137, Section 1 of the Rules of Court, a judge is disqualified to sit in every case in which he or his wife or child as pecuniarily interested as ears, legatee, creditor, or otherwise, or in which he is related to either party within the sixth degree of consanguinity or affinity, or to counsel within the fourth degree computed according to the rules of civil law, or in which he has been executor, administrator, guardian, trustee, or counsel, or in which he has presided in any inferior courts when his ruling or decision is the subject of review, without the written consent of all parties in interest, signed by them and entered upon the record. This rule enumerates the grounds under which a judge is legally disqualified from sitting in a case, and excludes all other grounds not specified therein. The judge may, however, in the exercise of his sound discretion, disqualify himself from sitting in a case for just or valid reasons other than those mentioned above. 
under said rule, the judge may voluntarily inhibit himself from sitting in a case for just and valid reasons other than those mentioned in the rule. Number two, a judge rendered a decision in a criminal case finding the accused guilty of a staffa. Counsel for the accused filed a motion for reconsideration, which was submitted without arguments. Later, another lawyer entered his appearance for the accused. The judge issued an order inhibiting himself from further sitting in the case because the latter lawyer had been among those who recommended him to the bench. Can the judge's voluntary inhibition be sustained? The judge may not voluntarily inhibit himself by the mere fact that the lawyer recommended him to the bench. In fact, the appearance of said lawyer is a test as to whether the judge can act independently and courageously in deciding the case according to his conscience. Inhibition is not allowed at every instance that a friend, classmate, associate, or patron of a presiding judge appears before him as counsel for one of the parties to a case. Utang na loob, per se, should not be a hindrance to the administration of justice, nor should recognition of such value in Philippine society prevent the performance of one's duties as judge. However, in order to avoid any suspicion of partiality, it is better for the judge to voluntarily inhibit himself. Q27. The family of Judge Matrabajo owns a small department store. With his knowledge, an employee of the store posted on the bulletin board of his court an ad for job openings, informing the public that applications must be filed in the office of the judge. For this purpose, the applicants would also be interviewed therein. Is the judge liable for misconduct? Explain. The judge is liable for misconduct. In the case of Donicia v. Escano, 302 Scraw 411, the Supreme Court held that the acts of posting advertisements for restaurant personnel on the court bulletin board, using his court address to receive applications, and of screening applicants in his court, constitute involvement in private business and improper use of court facilities for the promotion of family business in violation of the Code of Judicial Conduct. The restriction enshrined in Rules 5.02 and 5.03 of the Code of Judicial Conduct on the judges with regard to their own business interests is based on the possible interference which may be created by these business involvements in the exercise of their judicial duties which tend to corrode the respect and dignity of the courts as the bastion of justice. Judges must not allow themselves to be distracted from the performance of their judicial tasks by other lawful enterprises. Q28. While Judge Tuparin was in his chambers dictating an order to a stenographer, two lawyers who were in the courtroom waiting for the start of the session almost came to blows as a result of a heated argument. Tuparin came out of his chambers, and after identifying the lawyers involved in the commotion, promptly declared them in contempt of court. Was the action of Judge Tuparin proper? Explain. The action of Judge Tuparin in promptly declaring the two lawyers in contempt of court was improper. The act committed by the two lawyers was indirect contempt violative of the rule punishing any improper conduct tending directly or indirectly to impede, obstruct, or degrade the administration of justice. Since the judge was then engaged in dictating an order before the morning session was called, the act of the two lawyers constituted obstruction of the administration of justice, which was indirect contempt. Accordingly, they could only be punished after notice and hearing. Q29 what is remital of disqualification? As provided under Rule 313 of the Rules of Court, remital of disqualification means that a judge is qualified to, in a proceeding may, instead of withdrawing from the proceeding, disclose on record the basis of the disqualification.
If based on such disclosure, the parties and lawyers, independently of the judge's participation, all agree in writing that the reason for the inhibition is immaterial or insubstantial, the judge may then participate in the proceeding. The agreement signed by all parties and lawyers shall be incorporated in the record of the proceeding. Q30. Notary Public. Heck filed a complaint praying for the disbarment of retired Judge Santos. It was alleged that Judge Santos, prior to his appointment as RTC judge, notarized documents without the requisite notarial commission, therefore. Should a retired judge charged with notarizing documents without the requisite notarial commission more than 20 years ago be disciplined for such delinquency? Yes, it is settled that a judge may be disciplined for acts committed prior to his appointment to the judiciary. Although the judge has already retired from the judiciary, he is still considered as a member of the bar and as such is not immune to the disciplining arm of the Supreme Court. The fact that a judge has retired or has otherwise been separated from the service does not necessarily divest the courts of its jurisdiction to determine the veracity of the allegations of the complaint pursuant to its disciplinary authority over members of the bench. An administrative complaint against an erring lawyer who was thereafter appointed as a judge, albeit filed only 24 years after the offending act was committed, is not barred by prescription. It is the duty of this court to protect the integrity of the practice of law as well as the administration of justice. No matter how much time has elapsed from the time of the commission of the act, complained of, and the time of the institution of the complaint, erring members of the bench and bar cannot escape the disciplining arm of the court. Accordingly, it must be remembered that notarization is invested with public interest, such that only those who are qualified or authorized may act as notaries public. The court has characterized the Lawyers Act of notarizing documents without the requisite commission, therefore, as reprehensible, constituting as it does not only constitute malpractice, but also the crime of falsification of public documents. For such reprehensible conduct, the court has sanctioned erring lawyers by suspension from the practice of law, revocation of the notarial commission and disqualification from acting as such, and even disbarment. Time and again, we have stressed the settled principle that the practice of law is not a right but a privilege bestowed by the state on those who show that they possess the qualifications required by law for the conferment of such privilege. Possession of good moral character is not only a prerequisite to admission to the bar, but also a continuing requirement to the practice of law. A high sense of morality, honesty, and fair dealing is expected and required of a member of the bar. By his actuations, Judge Santos failed to live up to such standards. He undermined the confidence of the public on notarial documents and thereby breached Canon 1 of the CPR, which requires lawyers to uphold the Constitution, obey the laws of the land, and promote respect for the law and legal processes. Hence are Heck v. Judge Anthony E. Santos, February 23, 2004, Q31. Daguman is a special assistant of the spouses Oscar Martin and Mercedes Yvette Lopez and is authorized to represent and attend the auction sale of their property. The auction was to be held at 10 o'clock a.m. on August 28, 2002 at the Muntinlupa City Hall Quadrangle, National Road, Putatan, City of Mun, Tinlupa. The Guman reported to the office of the Clerk of Court of the RTC of Muntinlupa City, while Sheriff Bogobaldo arrived at his office at about 11.40 a.m. The Sheriff assured the Guman that the auction sale would be conducted after the lunch break. Upon the arrival of the mortgages representative, the Guman then returned to the sheriff's office at 1.05, and, to his surprise, the latter informed him that the auction sale had already been conducted at 12.20 p.m. 
The sheriff showed him the minutes of the auction sale, indicating that the subject property was sold to DBS Bank of the Philippines. A complaint for dereliction of duty was filed against the sheriff. Should the sheriff be held guilty of dereliction of duty? Yes, by his actuations, the sheriff displayed conduct short of the stringent standards required of court employees. He is guilty of simple neglect of duty, which has been defined as the failure of an employee to give one's attention to a task expected of him, and signifies a disregard of a duty resulting from carelessness or indifference. Sheriffs play an important role in the administration of justice as agent of the law. High standards are expected of them. The sheriff should be reminded that as an officer of the court, he should at all times show a high degree of professionalism in the performance of his duties. The imperative and sacred duty of each and every one in the court is to maintain its good name and standing as a temple of justice. The court condemns and would never countenance any conduct, act, or omission on the part of those involved in the administration of justice, which would violate the norm of public accountability and diminish or even just tend to diminish the fate of the people in the judiciary. Renato M. de Guman v. Melvin Bagubaldo A notice to vacate was issued by Sheriff Amoranto regarding a writ of execution that was issued by a judge. Thereafter, the order was enforced. However, the subject ejectment was actually and illegally executed at a different premise than that referred to in the order. Should the sheriff be held liable for negligence? Yes. The unfortunate incident could have been avoided had the sheriff observed due care and diligence in ascertaining the exact location of the property subject to the execution. The sheriff is a ranking officer of the court, a public official entrusted with a fiduciary role. He plays an important part in the administration of justice and is called upon to discharge his duties with integrity, due care, and circumspection. Anything less is unacceptable. This is because in serving the court's writs and processes and in implementing the orders of the court, sheriffs cannot afford to err without affecting the efficiency of the process of the administration of justice. Good faith on the part of the sheriff or lack of it in proceeding to properly execute his mandate would be of no moment, for he is chargeable with the knowledge that being an officer of the court, tasked, therefore, it behooves him to make due compliances. His duty in the execution of a writ is purely ministerial. He is to execute the order of the court strictly to the letter. Andy Lobregat v. Amoranto Q33 Notices to vacate were served to residents of San Isidro Makati by Sheriff Camposano and uncle. A few days thereafter, the sheriffs, together with police escorts and a demolition team, went to the barangay to implement the demolition order. The demolition was not implemented due to the strong resistance put up by the affected residents, including the Eberos. A heated argument ensued. In the course of the argument, the sheriffs ordered the police escorts to place the Eberos inside the patrol vehicle and bring them to Makati Police Station. A complaint for obstruction of justice were filed against the Eberos, and they were detained and were released only when the charge of obstruction of justice was dismissed by the inquest prosecutor. The Eberos then filed an administrative complaint against the sheriffs. Should the sheriffs be held liable even if no adequate evidence was presented by the Eberos? No. The quantum of proof necessary for a finding of guilt is substantial evidence or such relevant evidence as a reasonable mind may accept as adequate to support a conclusion. The presumption of regularity in the performance of the sheriffs of their duties must prevail. Allegations of the errors are not supported by those of another witness. Neither are the contentions of respondents corroborated by those of another witness. In other words, the evidence on record deals only with the word of complainants to be pitted against that of respondents. Sheriff's duty to execute a judgment is ministerial.
In the implementation of writs of demolition, as in the instant case, the sheriffs are mandated to use reasonable and necessary force to see that the judgment debtors vacate the premises. Innocentio Ebero and Juanito Ebero versus Makati City Sheriffs, Camposano and Bayani Anko.